Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. We've got another exciting episode where the ace couple, hi, that's me, Courtney, and my spouse, Royce, talks about asexual representation in media. The asexual community, or ace for short, famously has very little representation compared to other minority sexualities. And historically, some of that representation hasn't been very good. So that is why we've started this little mini-series within our broader podcast to talk about all of the ace media that we found and our opinions on it. Is it good ace representation or not? And I am thrilled to say that we have a very, very good one today. This one is a book, actually, a graphic novel comic style, and you may or may not be familiar with this. It, it is a fairly recent book. It was just published in 2021, a few short months ago, and I personally have not seen a lot of discussion around it in the broader online ace community yet. And I'm going to tell you right off the bat that that is a damn shame, because this book is so precious. I was smiling all the way through it. So let's get into it, why don't we? In today's edition of Asexual Representation, we are going to be discussing a book called Hang On, Everything is Going to Be A-OK -okay by Jared Green. Now, when it comes to books... Rice, you and I do read uh, together on occasion. However, you did not read this book with me. I just got it in the mail a couple days ago, and I was very excited. Since it is a graphic novel, it is 200-some pages, but very few words per page because of the artwork and the comic panels being very prominent in books like this. So it was a very quick, zippy read for me. And I just got excited and wanted to plow through it. So I'm going to tell you about this book and we can discuss it. First of all, the, the premise is middle school. Everybody's favorite time of their life. So for those of you who maybe have not read this book yet, I want you to mentally take yourself back to the eighth grade. Because that is the grade of our protagonist. So immediately the book opens up with our main character, Jay, and he is looking at his reflection, first in a pool and then in a mirror. And the artwork does this really clever thing where you can see little red dots all over his face. And you know that on an eighth grader, that is acne. But when he looks at his reflection, in the first half of the book, the red dots are so much bigger than they actually are on his face. So it's kind of demonstrating this middle school anxiety around appearance, which I'm sure anybody who has had acne can relate to. And he's really, really having an issue with this. So right off the bat, reason number one why I think this is very, very good ace rep is that the character is very multifaceted and has a variety of interests and personality traits and concerns and anxieties and just general problems and hurdles in his life. So you mean that unlike in some other media that we've reviewed before, they're actually a character instead of a token placement for asexuality? He is the main character, yes. And... Being asexual is not his only personality trait. This is a fully fleshed out, completely, utterly relatable eighth grader. This is a brand new world. It's a brand new world! And I like that he's young. I like that he's an eighth grader. There no doubt are some people who do find their asexuality at a younger age, like in middle school, but most of the representation we see, most of the real-life people discussing in forums online don't come into their asexuality until a bit later. You'll, you'll get some teenagers here and there, especially the, you know, Tumblr generation. Tumblr famously had a lot of asexual content that led to many people discovering themselves. 
Well, I feel like as a younger person trying to figure out your orientation, if you were to go to an adult, you're probably just going to hear, oh, you're just a, a late bloomer. You're s still in an earlier phase of your life. Yeah, you. when you find the right person, you'll know. Like, that, that is absolutely what younger people get. And many, many asexual people don't even discover the word for what they are until adulthood sometimes even mid to later adulthood. In fact, for me personally, since I started talking about asexuality online, I've had probably half a dozen people in their 60s or older who have sent me beautiful emails explaining that they've been a little different their entire life, but they didn't have the language for this because there, there wasn't a commonly known word back when they were younger and thanking me for spreading this. So asexuality is by no means new. It has been around, but in terms of access to this information and access to the community, the internet has really helped that to blossom and grow. But now that we're entering a new era where more people do know about asexuality, we've still, of course, got a long way to go, but I think it's high time that we start showing this representation for younger audiences. Because clearly, I, I am not the target demographic for this book, but because I didn't have a book like this when I would have been the target demographic, it still resonated with me and, and still was an utter joy to read. So the first day of school for the new school year comes for Jay, and you're introduced to his best friend on the bus. Uh, they're talking about their summer vacations. He, he got a guitar. He's taking lessons. He really wants to join and, and start a band. So you have a little bit of banter like that. You can tell this is an already established relationship. And once they get to school, the first thing Jay does is go to the office at school and try to fix his schedule. He's very clearly an overachiever. He is in like honors courses, but he's also an artist and he wants to take an art class. And they're having trouble f working it into his schedule because they say most people who take art classes aren't also in these, you know, higher, more advanced classes, which I can kind of relate to because <laughs> this woman uh, actually tries to encourage him, be like, oh, are you sure it's art class you want? What about, what if you take band class or you could take orchestra? Those would be easier to fit into your schedule. <laughs> Here's a fun little personal anecdote from my middle school experience. <laughs> I have never once in my life had a study hall. I, I know study hall is a thing that a lot of people have. <laughs> But the way my middle school worked, we'd have our core classes every day, like math, social studies, reading, writing, those kinds of things. But we'd have sort of alternating days to have a study hall or one sort of arts, performing arts kind of elective. But the very musically inclined uh, student could forego a study hall to take, for example, band one day, orchestra the next day, instead of band one day, study hall the next day. Courtney <laughs> went to the school counselors and I said, I want to be in band and orchestra and chorus. How do we make that happen? And they absolutely had to like work my schedule around and do like funky different things that like, to my knowledge, no other student, maybe one or two other students, but this was not a normal thing that they did. Did they hand you a time turner? <laughs> no, they did not hand me a time turner. <laughs> oh, what a horrible plot device. But <laughs> I basically, instead of just having like A, B days, like do one, then the other and flip flop, I basically had the ability to just make and write my own schedule <laughs> for, for that period. And... I would move it around based on, you know, oh, I'll take an extra band class this week if our band concert is coming up, or sort of like shuffle it around that way. So I also definitely did take like more complicated courses for some of my core classes uh, in eighth grade in particular, when I could have taken a fun elective like art, <laughs> I actually took a high school level language class that counted for high school credit, which there were not a lot of 
high school credit classes in my middle school, but I was way too ambitious for my own good. <laughs> in hindsight, I really, really killed myself trying to do it all. So even though, I mean, I, I had a little bit of acne, I, I didn't have quite an issue on the level of this character, so I didn't relate to him in that sense very much, but there are so many sides to this character that I think almost anybody who has been a middle schooler can probably find something about him that is very relatable. And for me, it was, you know, trying to get that last elective in there, even though you're, you gotta do weird schedule workarounds to make it happen. And boy, was I so proud of being an overachiever when I was in middle school. <laughs> but now as an adult and knowing like you and how you didn't just completely kill yourself over <laughs> overexerting and trying too hard and trying to do it all, I'm like, hmm, man, maybe I, uh, maybe I shouldn't have worked myself to death at such a young age for so many years. <laughs> but the reason why that is plot important is because he now has sort of a goofy, unconventional schedule. And he is in no classes with any of his pre-established friend group. They have a different lunch hour than he does. He doesn't share any of the same classes with them. So as a middle schooler, that is that is pretty upsetting. I, I remember as soon as we would get our schedules, I would call up all my friends and compare, you know, what classes are you in? That's interesting. For me, it was sixth grade that this happened. And it was because my town had five or six different elementary schools and one middle school and one high school. So all of a sudden, from fifth to sixth grade, the people, the, you know, 20-some people that I had been in class with for all of my school life up to that point were now in a class that was five or six times larger, and we were all split up amongst mm. different courses and teachers. Yeah, absolutely. And... That can be really tough socially on a kid. So it shows him going through his first day. He's really upset when he doesn't have anyone to sit with at lunch, when he he can't walk to his courses with his friends in the hallway because they're going to different places, all of that. But the, the way they were able to find this workaround was to let him basically be a teacher's assistant, like a, like a peer tutor kind of a situation one period so that he could go to art class the next period. And he ends up being like a doubled up teacher assistant with a new kid named Mark. And I guess I said new, he's not new new. It's implied that they, you know, have known each other by nature being in the same school, but they clearly weren't like close friends talking all the time. So this is their first real shot to really get to know each other now that they're teaching assistants together. And Mark is also an art kid and, and is also in the same art class. And in between days of this school, it, it shows uh, this poor kid, Jay, just really struggling with his acne issues. It shows him trying different you know, face washes, different topical ointments. And, and then there are some in inst instances of kids actually bullying him at school. So you're seeing these instances of people making fun of the fact that he was wearing a product that doubled as a concealer and, oh, now Jay's wearing makeup. You know, that, that kind of just mean teasing. So then you also have the bullying relatability because so many kids, unfortunately, are bullied for any number of reasons, and someone who has been bullied can relate to another bullied kid, even if they're bullied for different reasons. So it's it's just, it is very middle school. It is incredibly middle school, cover to cover, and I love it. It shows instances, even of our main character Jay sort of succumbing to peer pressure a little bit. He He begins to kind of lightly start associating with a mean crowd because... They're the only ones who are kind of talking to him right now. And even though they also tease him, they're teasing everybody else. And it shows him sort of in those bad friendships through like sheer social anxiety, piling on to someone else when they're teasing someone else. So you've got the peer pressure relatability. You've got the like <laughs> toxic friends. <laughs> Which, when your friend groups are in flux and you're young, that's something that just happens to so many people. 
And throughout all of this, you're also seeing little snips of Jay growing farther and farther apart from his former best friend, because they aren't in any classes anymore. His friend is getting new interests with the band and meeting new people and starting to hang out with different people. So you really start to see a wedge being formed in that friendship. All while this poor kid is still struggling with his acne. <laughs> Although here, here's the part of his acne journey that I cannot relate to in the slightest. He seems uh, to come from an exceptionally middle-class household, and his parents have insurance and money to take him to a dermatologist. <laughs> Which, I know dermatologists exist, but it has never once in my life seemed practical or worth it to go to a dermatologist, because they're a specialist. They're probably out of network. You're going to have to pay a lot out of pocket for that. And especially when I was in middle school, we didn't have money for that. I had a single mother and she had a lot of health issues of her own at the time. So we, we didn't go to doctors when we didn't absolutely have to. So by the time I had like a little bit of an issue with acne, that was just not even on our radar, nor would it have been closest thing we ever got was my grandmother buying what was that brand that was everywhere p it starts with a p proactive does that sound correct yeah i think she bought some like proactive products either either from an 800 number like infomercial or maybe it was a kiosk in the mall <laughs> i don't know one of those two increasingly more antiquated means of purchasing things <laughs> And it was miserable because it actually like made my face worse. I used it like twice and broke out worse than I had ever in my life. And so then I had to stop using it. But my, my grandmother was such that like, I couldn't tell her that it didn't work and that I wasn't going to use it anymore because I knew that she'd take it personally and kind of, you know, hold over your head a little bit like, I bought this for you. So, but at the same time, you also needed her to not continue buying it. Well, it was, it was more of a just, I obviously stopped using it <laughs> and the, the like additional worse breakout that came as a result of it, like eventually subsided, but the, the baseline was still there. And I mean, I loved my grandmother to death, but she, she'd rib your appearance a little bit. She was very, very critical in that sense. Like, she, she would comment on your hair or, or your skin or your clothes if something wasn't quite right. So there was definitely like a moment uh, where she was like, your skin doesn't seem to be getting any better. Have you been using that proactive I bought you? And I just had this moment of like, oh no. <laughs> What do I say? So the fact that this kid in this book, he goes to not one but two dermatologists. That's right. When the first one wasn't working for him, he's like, mom, dad, let's go see a different dermatologist who uses other methods. I was like, well. And yeah, he begins very intensive treatments, very intensive. There are topical things. There are face washes. There's like regular blood draws that are necessary because this medication, it like pills also. And I didn't even know there were acne treatments this aggressive, if I'm being perfectly honest. But yeah, he's getting like monthly blood draws to make sure that his like triglyceride levels aren't too high because this medication can cause that. And I'm like, boy, that's, that's pretty intense. So yeah, I... I don't know how many middle schoolers actually are in families that not only have the means to take you to like real serious dermatologists over acne, but also the desire to. But that was the only part of this book where I'm like, I can't relate to that on any level. But you know, good for him. So yeah, I don't know. Let me check in with you, Royce, because... I feel like I've been saying a lot of these things are very relatable to a lot of people, but maybe it's just me. The acne, not as much, maybe a touch, but the the things like bullying, drifting away from friend groups, b 
being an overachiever in middle school when it's really not necessary. All of those things. Do you, do you actually have anything to relate to in any of those? Definitely not at the same level that you have. I think some things are close enough to a generalized experience, but overall I think this book has you pegged a lot more than it does me. Ah, I see. Yeah, and I mean, like, these people are calling him, like, porcelain doll, trying to get perfect skin. At one point, someone calls him Rudolph, uh, I'm sure alluding to, like, a big red pimple on his nose. So, like, I never really got bullied on that level, like, appearance-wise in middle school. Actually, for, for a lot of my middle school career, I was kind of, like untouchably weird. I was kind of unbullyable because I was just so like brazenly strange. <laughs> and and how do you make some like make fun of someone who just like owns their weirdness? So I can't say that I had a lot of bullying. But actually this is kind of interesting in hindsight. The one like really serious case of bullying I got in middle school was actually a bunch of, like, the football playing boys, like, making fun of me for being a lesbian, which is odd because I have no idea what they were picking up on me that gave them that impression whatsoever. I famously, like, dated a boy throughout most of my middle school career. <laughs> And, like, went to school dances with him. So, like, people knew that. And yet it was eighth grade specifically that these boys would, like, walk a little too close for comfort behind me and of a friend of mine. They were kind of making fun of both of us. I don't think we were giving off couple vibes. <laughs> but we were both women. And and they'd do this, like, oh, let's be honest over here. Let, let's be honest, ladies. And, and like... <laughs> That that was the level of bullying that I received in eighth grade, which now I'm so curious. If I, if I could find those boys and interview them, like, why did you think I was a lesbian in eighth grade? <laughs> what about me gave you that impression? Well, we've spoken in private a bit recently about how some people who aren't very clued into the larger LGBT umbrella, if they just sense something that seems non-heteronormative, the first assumption is homosexual, because that's the only other that they know. Yeah, like, you don't seem straight, so you must be gay without any evidence. So yeah, that was kind of interesting. But other than that, I was, I was just, like, shamelessly odd. So <laughs> I, I think people just left me alone for the other, like, more conventional things that I would have been bullied for in middle school. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this was how much of an oddball overachiever I was. We read a book in eighth grade about a girl who every time someone had a birthday would bring her ukulele to school and would play and sing happy birthday on the ukulele in the lunchroom to that person. And she wore like really weird dresses. They described it as like pioneer clothes. And while we were reading that book, a friend of mine was having a birthday that was coming up. And so I was like, well, I'm doing this. I got a dress that my great grandmother made for my mom when she was a kid and I found it and I wore it to school and I brought my ukulele and I will be damned if I did not stand in the middle of the cafeteria singing happy birthday to my friend on that day. And then I used that to ask for extra credit in that class and I got it. <laughs> ha ha! Good times, good weird times. <laughs> not that great. Those times were not that great. <laughs> I say good times. They weren't the worst times, but they weren't good times either. But yeah, so so Jay starts to get to know Mark a little better through their TAing. At first, they don't sit together in art class, and Jay's actually a little upset about that because he's thinking, oh, this is a new friend I'm actually starting to make, and I don't know anyone else in this class. But he does sit next to a girl who is named Amy. And all the while, his skin issues aren't getting resolved. So it, it shows, and, and this is what I really like about uh, media in the internet age, is showing realistic uses of the internet. <laughs> because it it has panels of this kid at home, like, searching for 
alternative acne treatments and doing his own research so that he can actually ask for a treatment by name the next time he goes to a dermatologist after his current treatment isn't working. And he's also reading all these reviews on this blog of other people who've done this. So he's reading all these like, oh, it'll get worse before it gets better. And so he's kind of like mentally preparing himself that way. And that is very realistic. I am actually very much in favor of doing your own research um, when it comes to medical situations, even though most doctors tell you don't, but I wouldn't have half of the diagnoses or treatments that I do if I didn't do the research first and then put it in front of my doctor's face to confirm. And throughout the first portion of this book, Jay always wears a hoodie. That's like his signature style. He wears a hoodie pretty much every day. But one of the acne treatments that he gets put on makes him like really hot and feel just like sweaty and gross. So he starts taking off the hoodie, wearing t-shirts, and his new friends start to take notice. This Amy notices, Mark notices, and they draw attention to the fact that, oh, you usually wear a hoodie, like all of the time. He has some serious mood swings, gets a little snippy with his parents at some time, which they chalk up to irritability with the medication, but that's also just kind of being an eighth grader. But you know, his family overall seems very supportive. He begins to see incremental progress in, in his acne treatments, but never enough that he's satisfied. And he's at a bookstore with his family at one point and pulls down a magazine that's just like a style guide for men. And it's it's very much one of those... Well, I, I guess when I was in middle school, I, I had like little like teen fashion magazines and stuff like this. I don't know how common they are anymore, but it was like how to dress your best and how to look attractive no matter who you are, what your body looks like. And it just it just has these tips like wear clothes that fit you. <laughs> don't wear oversized things <laughs> like it doesn't give you the entire rundown, but he sees this at the bookstore and just feels completely inspired because he is not feeling okay with the way he looks right now and he hasn't ever since he started getting this acne. So he starts thinking, maybe I should try this. Maybe if I'm a snappy enough dresser, that'll, I know, pull some attention away from my face. So he, he asks his mom and his older sister if he can go shopping with them and he gets all these new clothes. And he's basically like, damn, I look good. <laughs> and he's like, I didn't know you could feel so good just by changing your clothes up. There was one moment that I had to giggle at a little bit because he gets like jeans, like pants that fits. Beforehand, it's just showing him in like baggy shorts. And he turns around and says, hmm, do I have a cute butt? And the cute butt is just a thing I have heard my entire life and just never understood. I think I've mentioned on a previous episode that my grandmother would always like point out cute butts to me and I'd be like, what makes a butt cute? I don't understand. I'd try to like take mental note of the butt she's calling out to me and try to compare them to all the other butts of the world to try to like analyze what makes a butt cute. <laughs> but yeah, he starts feeling a little good. He he says, oh, maybe we, maybe we change up the hair next. Let's Let's get some hair gel and get a get a new do. So at this point, I am I am very happy for this young man. He's coming into school all confident. He's getting compliments on his cute new shirts and he's like, "Mwahaha, my plan is working." He at one point gets Oh, and throughout this, like when he's like, "Oh, I want to get new clothes. I want to get a new style." Of course his mom does the whole like is there anyone special you're dressing up for? Which is a thing parents do to their children. But I just feel like there's there's no good outcome to that question. Because in this case, he genuinely did not have anyone he was dressing up for. He's like, no, I'm just doing this for me. But I feel like in any middle school, like 8th grade, 13, 14 year old situation... If you want your parent to know that you have a crush on someone, I think they will know that you have a crush on someone. And I think if they ask and pry, there there are very few young tweens and teens who are just going to be like, oh yeah, well, actually, let me tell you all about it. 
But I thought that little line snuck in about like, is this for someone special? Very, very clever. Because at this point, we don't have any indication about his asexuality at all. So once you get to that point, that line hits a little different. It hits a little harder. It has a different implication altogether. But yeah, his his new friend Amy from art class calls him up and invites him to a movie. And of course, his mom also does the like, there's a girl on the phone for you, which I'm reading a book, but I... I can hear the tone of infle- <laughs> the inflection. It's like, it's a girl. <laughs> you, you know that if this was animated, she'd also be doing the eyebrows. But yeah, they end up going to the movies. They seem to have a good time. There's a panel while they're in the movie where the girl's kind of giving him the eyes and it's like, ah, I think that girl has a crush on him. Hmm. But of course, they're in middle school, so no one actually like prefaces this as this is a date or I like you. Like, no, no conversation. No communication is happening. <laughs> this is all just heavily implied by the artwork and the knowledge of what it's like to be an eighth grader, honestly. There's also this, this is unrelated to the plot, but I liked it. <laughs> there's, there's a, well, I, I assume it's a fictional book series called Misfortune's Orphans, that two of the characters are reading and enjoying. And I just really hope that's like a parody of a series of unfortunate events. Because I agree, 10 out of 10, great book series. (laughs) But then there is another precursor to the asexuality drop, which I love and is again, very relatable, where this group of girls come up to him at school and they're like, quizzing him, asking him a bunch of questions that at first is like, oh, which teacher do you like best, this one or that one? But then they're like, who do you like better, Kate Winslet or Kate Beckinsale? And he's like, uh, I don't know. Um, neither, both. Uh, do I have to choose? And they're like, yes, you have to choose. And he's like, uh, you this one, I guess. And you can see he's just like really uncomfortable in the artwork and doesn't really know how to respond. But then they drop it with like, who do you like? <laughs> like, is there someone in school that you think is cute? Which as someone who who used to be a young girl, I can only imagine that what happened behind the scenes was a girl, probably Amy, went to all her other girlfriends and was like, I like Jay. But I I can't just ask him if he likes me. You guys ask him for me. Because <laughs> that's definitely a thing that young girls do. Like, the, these, are, these are wing ladies, for sure, who in their very poorly communicated way were trying to pump him for information. But yeah, it's after that and after this, like, kind of not really movie date where... You see him just sitting alone, and he's trying to draw, he's tapping his pencil, he's thinking, he's ruminating, and he's like, what am I missing here? I don't understand. Aren't I supposed to like someone? I just, I never feel that way about anybody. And then it's like, oh, here it comes. The asexual plotline is upon us. And he's clearly struggling. He he doesn't really understand this about himself. And so his first means of trying to figure this out is to actually reach out to his former best friend who he hasn't spoken to very much over the last several months. But he tries calling him. He's not home. He tries calling him again. He tries talking to him at school. The conversation kind of gets sidelined. And he just like really can't catch a break. He's trying to connect with his friend and ask a serious question, but his friend is just off on another planet. And he finally, finally, like, gets this friend to agree to hang out. And he goes over to his house. And at first, they're just kind of like reminiscing, like, oh, I remember this beanbag chair. And oh, remember when we used to do this all the time and starting to do the things that uh, reconnecting friends do. And then they had this moment lying on on the floor and on this kid's bed where they say like, oh, remember when we put on uh, this movie and watched it on repeat until we found asleep? We were so weird. But yeah, that movie was hypnotizing. 
And even that feels like it's pulled directly out of my middle school experience. Because with my best friend at the time, the same one who everyone thought we were lesbians, for some reason, for us that was the Beatles' Yellow Submarine. That movie was trippy as hell. But we were obsessed with the Beatles. We listened to all of the Beatles CDs that we had between the two of us. We would seek out Beatles music videos. <laughs> And, and we would watch the Beatles' Yellow Submarine for hours on end when we had sleepovers. It would just, like, always be on. So, yeah, I don't... Is that a particular quirk of middle schoolers that they can just watch the same movie over and over with their friend? Because <laughs> I think that's the only period in my life where I ever did that. I did not have a period of doing that. So that's, that's just a Courtney thing. Courtney and a J. Noted. But yeah, then then his friend is a little rude and like invites over the whole band and a few other friends without asking him. And he thought they were just going to be the two of them so he could ask this very important question of like, am I supposed to like someone? What does it mean if I don't? But that conversation does not take place. His friend kind of blows him off for these other people. So he's feeling very, very down. He's also really starting to realize how close his old friend has gotten with all of these other people and how he hasn't been invited to any of the things that they've been doing together and just feels really, really lonely in that moment. And yeah, he has a birthday. His old friend doesn't even come to his birthday. The new friend Amy from math class gets him a hoodie because she observed that he always wears a hoodie. And he was very happy about that present. Um, he thought it was great, but he also couldn't wear it because this new medication was making him just like really hot all the time. So he was excited, but just didn't wear it. Amy took that a little bit personally. It's heavily hinted at this point that Amy has a crush on him. And while you're kind of, you know, expecting Amy to ask him out again since they already went to the movies, actually, someone else beats Amy to it. And Mark from teaching assistant and art class actually asks him out first. So we also have that good, good gay representation in eighth grade. And he does that whole like very awkward, like we're still in eighth grade, like, would you want to go out sometime? Dot, dot, dot. With me. <laughs> and, and there's that moment of like, oh, like, do you mean on a date? And he's like, yeah, oh, well. And, and that's when they have this conversation where Jay says, I'm sorry, but I, I don't really feel that way about you. And Mark's like, oh, no, that, that's okay. I, I wasn't sure. I didn't know. And, but that's when Jay, who has been trying to reach out to his old friend this whole time, finally confesses this to someone else. He says, you know, if I'm being honest, I don't really feel that way about anyone. I think there might be some piece of me that's missing. And that's when Mark said, nah, that doesn't sound right. He's like, I, I don't think that sounds true. And kind of has this reassuring moment with him that says, you don't have to like anyone. So it's this very, very sweet moment. They don't drop the word asexual yet, but Mark definitely seems to get it. But yeah, and it's also around this time that Jay starts talking to one of the more popular kids, one of the more like bro -er boys who he, he doesn't like all that much at first, but through school reasons, they're, they're talking more often. And that boy definitely has a moment of like, man, that girl that's tutoring us, she's a babe. <laughs> and so this boy who is now not exactly out as an ace, but has, has confided to one of his friends that he doesn't feel that way about anyone, he's like, you think she's a babe, but I I, th I thought you liked this other girl. And he's like, yeah, I like that other girl too. And then he like makes a comment about a third girl and he's like, they're all babes. I I, I love all of them. And he's like, yeah, they're hot. And this, this poor ace boy just like so confused, so utterly confused while this other guy's just like daydreaming about all of these babes. Also very relatable. Yeah, and you know, now that I'm thinking back to it, also just the like, here are two conventionally attractive celebrities, like pick one, which do you like better? That's definitely a game that kids play. And that is definitely a game that even in, even younger than middle school, I didn't really get. 
I didn't realize exactly that people genuinely were attracted to these celebrities, but I saw everyone like picking their favorite. <laughs> so I just also picked one. <laughs> I mean, there, there was definitely the, the most clear cut example of this was back dur during the era of boy bands. Everyone was picking like their favorite member of the Backstreet Boys or their favorite member of NSYNC. And I just remember people egging me on like, who's, who's your favorite boy band member? And I was like, I don't have one. And they were like, no, tell us who you have to like one. Who do you think is the cutest? Like, who's the hottest? Who, who do you want to marry? And all, all these like ludicrous questions. And I remember finally just saying, well, I, I guess I need to pick one. This is the game. This is how people social. You just pick your favorite one and stick to it. So I just like semi-arbitrarily picked Lance from NSYNC. I was like, Lance is my favorite. That is my boy band crush. And that was met with like, Lance can't be your crush because Lance is gay. And I was kind of like, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> I, I have just never had any interest in anyone that I thought would even remotely have like heterosexual feelings about me. <laughs> but I was like, no, you made me pick my favorite. I picked. <laughs> there you have it. It's Lance. So th that's, that's another just like baby ace thing, <laughs> which like in hindsight, at the time, I didn't have the language to explain what I was. I didn't have a book like this uh, telling me that some people just don't feel that way, and that's fine. So I just, yeah, I just, I just played the game because everyone was asking me to. But then my favorite moment, <laughs> my favorite couple of moments is, you know, Mark and Jay are still friends. And Jay mentions that, you know, Amy gave me a hoodie for my birthday, but I haven't been able to wear it because I'm too hot. And he's like, she gave you a what? She gave you a hoodie? And I, I don't really understand the implications of this too much, I'll admit. But he's like, it is so obvious that she likes you. She got you a hoodie. Like, what else could that mean? She has a crush on you, dude. And he's like, but no, 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 really? And, and he's like, yeah, clearly she has a crush on you. She got you a hoodie. And he's like, but that's, that's such a nice gift. And it clearly means that she likes you, but I haven't seen you wear it. And he's like, yeah, I haven't because I'm too hot. And then Mark says, and this is a direct quote. I'm reading it from the book because I like it so much. He says, well, there's your answer. I guess you really don't think about people romantically. A real ace. And then it just has Jay in the background with a question mark over his head, and he's going, Ace? And so, our protagonist has been called an ace. Time to Google that. <laughs> so, I love that they already showed him Googling something before, because now that it is an identity thing that he's figuring out, it's very subtle, but you see a panel of him clicking private window before going to search this, which he did not do in his previous search. And that says a lot without saying a lot. I like it. But he he's like, what is the definition of ace? And I love the list of results because it's so true. I actually uh, cackled out loud as I read this panel of his search <laughs> because in order it's the highest playing card in a suit. Find local hardware stores in your area <laughs> and a person who excels. And then later it's may refer to asexual. And from there he clicks on asexual and gets the definition of, you know, a lack of sexual desire or attraction. And it doesn't spoon feed you every single thing, which I, I actually do like, but it gives you sort of the key words that would be memorable when you're going down this first rabbit hole. And in sort of this bulleted format, it gives you the invisible identity, a spectrum, romantic, aromantic, gray ace, some do, some don't, not broken. And it, it shows him looking through all of these. There's even, if you pay attention to the artwork, you see a moment of like realization kind of pop up in his face. And so I really, really like it because then 
His mom busts into the room and was like, hey, what you doing? And he instantly closes that tab and has a game of solitaire up on the desktop. And he's like, I'm just playing solitaire. (laughs) Which is, it's just such a nice touch. Because you see so many people online who don't really get asexuality and don't really think of it as a valid queer orientation who will say like, Oh, if you're ace, you're basically straight. Um, you don't really face discriminations. You haven't had to grapple with your identity the same way, you know, gay people have or bi people have. And so you hear that kind of thing a lot. But showing this little scene, I think, is so relatable on so many levels. And like I said before, it says a lot without saying a lot. It's, it's really, really well done. And, and after he, like, leaves the room in a panic because his mother almost, like, saw what he was searching, he just, like, gets alone in his bedroom and, and cracks a little smile. And it's very lovely. It, this is such a cute book, and it makes me very, very happy. <laughs> I, I really love it. We're just about done with all of the cliff notes, but I want to just really reemphasize how special it is to have a book for this demographic and to have a middle schooler go through these very relatable steps. Because not only if if younger people who are asexual themselves, or this, this book could even, you know, work pretty well for any aromantic people, because it, it doesn't really specify either way if he does or does not have a romantic orientation. It doesn't really delve into that. It could be very relatable for people who are both or either. And it's important for those young people to to be exposed to this language young, because it would spare a lot of people an identity crisis, for one. But it's also important for people who are not asexual to learn about asexuality younger, because... One of the biggest issues that we face in our community is that people don't know about us and they don't get us and they don't understand the struggles that we face as a community. And so there would just be more empathy in the public eye if more people learned about this at a younger age. And reading is such a good way to gain empathy for experiences that aren't your own. It really is, especially when it's at a young age. And I think this book is full of enough middle school relatability that even if you aren't asexual yourself, and even if you aren't aromantic yourself, whether you're queer or not, I think there are a lot of people who are going to relate to this character one way or another. And that's really, really vital to just fostering more education and more care. So really, we we do need more things that are... (laughs) focused around this age group, both in terms of characters and and in demographic. We need more ace content that is geared for younger people. Absolutely. So yeah, Jay continues to not wear his hoodie because he's still on this medication and he's still very hot all the time. The girl Amy who gave him the hoodie is taking note of the fact that it's been a long time and you have never once worn that hoodie that I gave you, so... Like I said before, she starts to take it personally, and she actually lashes out at him at one point and says something really mean, and that made me very sad. I'm sure girls and women also do this. I'm absolutely sure. But that is such a thing I have noticed from guys, is that as soon as they don't see you as, like, a viable person to date and or have sex with, they'll just, like, stop being friendly. (laughs) Like, they will only be friendly to you as long as they think they might get something out of it. And friendship isn't enough (laughs) for people like that. So that's also a little relatable. They do talk it out. (laughs) He, He lets her know what the deal actually is. He kind of keeps his acne treatments a secret for the most part. So he finally shares that secret. Um, and she gets it. So it's fine. And they're friends again which I'm happy about. I'd be really upset if they just weren't friends after she was like, he he doesn't like me that way, so we're just not going to talk. But at the same time, it would have been fairly realistic if that's how it did go. But uh, no, this has a much happier ending. They do have a fairly realistic resolution to his acne troubles because 
it clears up a lot. It gets a lot better. He still has a few like red marks on his face when it's all said and done. And he's like, this isn't what my skin looked like before all this happened. So at first he's a little disappointed, but then he compares photos from before the treatment. And the clever thing with the artwork is that he starts to see himself in the mirror as he actually is. And he doesn't see the like gross over exaggerations that he saw at the beginning of the book. And he starts to feel a lot more comfortable with himself, even though he recognizes he still has a long way to go on this journey. He's a lot more content. And I think that's really good because I don't think it would have been realistic if they were like, great, you have perfect flawless skin now after six months or so. <laughs> so I thought that was very cleverly done as well. But once he does get off his medication, he's not super hot anymore, so he can wear that hoodie. And Rice, do you want to guess what color that hoodie is? Is it purple? It is purple! So he has discovered himself, he knows he is asexual, he's also kind of, as a parallel, gone through this acne journey, just self-discovery and self-acceptance all at the same time in different areas of his life. And he comes out on the other end and he's wearing the purple hoodie, which is just so perfect for the asexual plot line. I really hope that was intentional. I can't see how it wouldn't be because purple is just so iconic in the ace community and it's the, the prominent color on our flag and a lot of our iconography. So, so that was a nice touch. <laughs> that probably anyone who is an ace wouldn't notice that, but I noticed that and I loved it. And he never totally, totally tells the girl Amy that he's not interested in her romantically. She's still kind of dropping hints. They're still friends, they're still hanging out, but just like the last beautiful moment of just like queer camaraderie is when Mark, the gay boy who previously asked him out and was the first one to bring up the word ace kind of just says like have have you told her yet <laughs> like what your deal is and and he's like no i i haven't yet and he said you know you could just tell her that you're ace and jay says i still don't know how to talk about that with other people and and mark just says oh don't worry i totally understand but you'll figure it out eventually and it's like oh. It's, it's so cute. They get it. They get each other. And yeah, there are a lot of other little, you know, tinier nuances throughout the book. Different school things, other side characters, but that's the main plot line. And I loved every minute of it. If you are an adult and you're a quick reader, like I, I think I read this in an hour, two tops. Um, it is pretty breezy since it is a comic. I think it would be really, really great for young people to read if you have any, you know, younger siblings, younger cousins, if you have kids, if your friends have kids. Um, I think this would be a great gift. If you're a teacher, I think this is a great addition to your classroom library. I just, all around, I love it, and I want more people to read it. Even if you're an adult and you're also listening to this, just thinking, hey, you know, I didn't have a book like this when I was a young baby ace, <laughs> when I didn't have this language. It, it can be a bit of a cathartic read. It, it really, it felt nice. It gave me the warm fuzzies. <laughs> so definitely recommend. I love it. I hope we see more. I, I want more things about and for kids. I really, really do. Because that is how we change culture for the better, <laughs> truthfully. Kids have minds and opinions that are still being formed, and they have so much empathy. And honestly, I, I've worked with kids a lot in my life and career in varying places. I worked with kids for 15 years. <laughs> I love kids personally, and sometimes I wonder why do I even bother making content for adults? <laughs> adults can be so fickle and stuck in their ways. Adults can be so mean, and kids are better. I don't have any kids of my own. We don't have kids 
Uh, chances are we probably won't ever have our own kids, but I will love everybody else's kids unconditionally. <laughs> and I want to give all of those kids more Ace content. End of story. So yeah, once again, this book is A-OK. -okay. Full title, Hang On, Everything is Going to Be A-OK, -okay, by Jared Green. I personally purchased it off of Bookshop. You can Google it and purchase it yourself, and I highly recommend that you do. And we'll make sure to uh, share some links. We'll put links in the description, and we'll be tweeting them out on our account at the Ace Couple. Underscores between each of those words. And if you have any recommendations for other asexual content that you would like us to review in this year, please don't hesitate to tweet at us and let us know. We love books, TV shows, movies, games, anything with ace rep we are willing to investigate, and we might do a future episode on it. But until then, go buy this book, and we will talk at you all next time.